Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram Patita Pavana Sita Ram Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram Patita Pavana Sita Ram Hare Krishna I'm Druta Karma Das I've been asked to speak today on the topic of human antiquity and the pastimes of Lord Ram. So, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Janma karma chame divyam evam yoveti tattvataha Takva deham punar janma naiti mam eti so arjuna. That means the pastimes and the appearance of the avatars of Krishna are very important. If we understand them properly, then we become qualified to enter into the pastimes of Lord Krishna ourselves. So Krishna comes himself in his original form, and he also appears in other forms. And today we're celebrating the appearance of Lord Krishna in his form as Ramachandra, the ideal king, the ideal leader, the ideal husband. The accounts are well known to you. Uh, Ram appeared as the son of King Dasarat for reasons that are well known. He was exiled and had to go into the forest. He was accompanied by his brother, Lakshman, and his wife, Sita, Sita Devi. So they spent many years traveling through the forest, and they went to South India, the southern part of India, and Sita was kidnapped by the demon Ravana, and Ravana took her to his island kingdom of Lanka. Ram and Lakshman, assisted by the Vanaras, rescued Sita. They went to Lanka, they defeated Ravana, and brought brought her back to their kingdom of Ayodhya where they ruled. So that's basically the account. And we, we may wonder when this took place. According to the Vedic literature, the pastimes of Lord Ram took place in a Treta Yuga. So, and we have to understand something about the Vedic concept of, of time. Time is cyclical, according to the Vedic literature. And uh, one set of these time cycles is called the uh, Chatur Yuga, a cycle of four ages or yugas. The first in a cycle is called the Satya Yuga. Then come the Treta Yuga, the Dwapra Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. We are now in the Kali Yuga, the age of Kali. It started about 5,000 years ago, roughly and it will continue for another 427,000 years. So if we want to go to the Treta Yuga, 
we have to go back through 5,000 years of the Kali Yuga. Then we have to go back through 864,000 years of the Dwapara Yuga. And then we're in the Treta Yuga. And it's stated in different sources that the pastimes of Lord Ram took place towards the beginning of the Treta Yuga, which would be about 1,800,000 years ago. However, from other sources, the Lagu Bhagavatamrita of Rupa Goswami, one of the six Goswamis, the principal associates of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In that book, Rupa Goswami says that the pastimes of Lord Ram took place not in the Treta Yuga of the current Chatur Yuga, but in a previous Chatur Yuga. According to the Vedic cosmology, the, the basic unit of time is the Kalpa, or the day of Brahma. It's 4,320,000 years. And the Kalpa is divided into 14 Manvantar periods. And each Manvantar period is composed of 71 Chatur Yugas. So we are now in the Kali Yuga of the 28th Chatur Yuga of the seventh Manvantar of the current day of Brahma, if you want to know what day it is. So, according to Rupa Goswami, the pastimes of Lord Ram took place in the Treta Yuga of the 24th Chatur Yuga of the current Manvantar, the Vaivasvata Manvantar that we live in now. That means it was about 18 million years ago. So whether we're talking about the most recent Treta Yuga or the uh, Treta Yuga of the 24th Chatur Yuga. That's 18 million years. So whether it's 1.8 million years ago or 18 million years ago, it's a long time. So many people will consider this kind of idea, the, the idea that humans could have been existing on this planet millions and millions of years ago to be simply some kind of mythology, not to be taken seriously at all. Uh, but that's uh, uh, a point of view that's based on you know, the modern scientific idea that humans like ourselves first appeared on this planet less than 300,000 years ago. Before that, they would say there were no humans like us. There were only more primitive ape-like human ancestors. And before that, not even any apes and monkeys, just some simple mammals. And before that, the reptiles, the dinosaurs, the amphibians, fish living in the ocean, and 
eventually, you know, you come back just to some chemicals floating in the ocean. But, you know, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, that's not the case. Humans have always been present on on Earth. Of course, the Earth and the whole universe, according to the Vedic cosmology, go through cycles of creation and destruction. So there's not just one creation. There's not just one universe. There are actually millions of universes constantly going through these cycles of creation and destruction again and again and again. So we're just in one of them. And uh, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, the creation takes place at the beginning of each kalpa or day of Brahma. And in this current kalpa, the first manvantar in, in the kalpa in the day of Brahma is the Swayambhuva manvantar. And human beings, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, were present. They were manifested in the universe, on this planet, at that time, almost two billion years ago, according to modern calculations. And it even gives examples of the humans that lived at that time. One of them was Dhruva Maharaj. And it stated that, you know, I mean, he was this boy saint. And he went to the forest to find God. And the Srimad Bhagavatam explains what forest he went to. It was the Madhavan forest in, near Mathura in the region of Vrindavan. So he went to the forest. Narada Muni gave him some instructions how to meditate. So he meditated. And if you go to Mathura today, you can still see the Madhavan forest. You can find temples that commemorate Dhruva Maharaj. But those events took place, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, at the very beginning of the Kalpa, or the day of Brahma. And human beings have been present on this planet continuously since then. So you have uh, the pastimes of Lord Ram taking place during the seventh Manvantar in, the, in this day of Kalpa. Like I said, there are uh, 14 Manvantars in a Kalpa or day of Brahma. And we're now in the seventh, the Vaivasvata. And that Manvantar is divided into 71 Chatur Yugas. And the pastimes of Lord Ram, according to Rupa Goswami, took place about 18 million years ago in the Treta Yuga of the 24th. Chatur Yuga. So, as I said, we're now in the Kali Yuga of the 28th Chatur Yuga. So, it's about 18 million years ago. So, as a devotee of Lord Krishna, um, a statement from the Shastras is sufficient evidence for me. You know, some some people will wonder, well, where's where's the evidence that humans were existing millions millions of years ago? Where's the evidence for that? And here we should 
understand something about the Vedic epistemology. Now, epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with how do we how do we know things? What is evidence? So, in the books of Srila Prabhupada, you know, we find many references to the works of Jiva Goswami, who was one of the six Goswamis. He was uh, a follower of the six Goswamis, Rupa, Sanatan, and of the others. He was a one of their followers. And he wrote some books called uh, Satsandarbhas. And he explains that there are different kinds of evidence or pramanas. One type of pramana or evidence is pratyaksha pramana, sense evidence, things that we can see and touch and hear. And that, that's one type of evidence. And then there's anumana pramana, what we can logically infer from sense evidence. And modern science is based on the pratyaksha pramana and the anumana pramana, uh, sense evidence and what we can logically infer from sense evidence. But the Vedic literature points out that our senses are limited and imperfect. And the mind that we use for logic is also imperfect. It can make mistakes. It can become illusioned. It can become the victim of cheating. So therefore, according to the Vedic epistemology, the conclusions that come from Pratyaksha and Anumana are not perfect. You know, they can't be relied upon to give certain knowledge. For that, there's another Pramana, according to the Vedic epistemology, and that is the Shabda Pramana, the evidence that comes from transcendental sound. So this is based on the idea that there is a supreme, intelligent, conscious being who's the source of everything and has perfect knowledge of it and is capable of communicating that knowledge to human society through the medium, initially, of transcendental sound vibration, which is later recorded in textual form in the different categories of Vedic literature. And that, according to the Vedic epistemology, is the most reliable source of knowledge, the most reliable evidence. So if as a devotee, I'm in a, a gathering of other devotees who accept the Shabda Pramana, then as evidence for human antiquity, humans existing millions of years ago, I can simply give statements from the Shastras. You know, I can give a statement from the Srimad Bhagavatam or the Bhagavad Purana that humans have been existing since the beginning of the Kalpa, the beginning of the day of Brahma. And I could give evidence from other Vedic literatures. But if I'm speaking, as I sometimes do, at a meeting of 
the European Association of Archaeologists or some other scientific gathering, uh, they don't accept a statement from Shastra, from the Ramayana or the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Purana. They don't accept that as evidence. You know, they want to know is is there any archaeological evidence for this idea that humans were existing millions of of years ago? So there there is such evidence, and you know I I. In my, in my career as a member of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and a, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, I uh, was brought into the activities of the Bhaktivedanta Institute in 1984, I was asked by the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust trustees to work with Sada Puta Prabhu, who was a, a founding member of the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And you know, we published a, a, a publication, it was called Origins Magazine, which laid out the basic positions of the Bhaktivedanta Institute on different scientific questions, such as the origin of consciousness, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of species. And as part of that publication, there was a section on archaeology. And then we decided to turn that, each section of that original short publication into a book. And I was given the archaeology topic to work on because the Puranas and the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, the Itihasas and the Puranas do speak of human populations that existed millions and millions of years ago. And the pastimes of Lord Ram and the Vanaras and the others are an example of that. Uh, of course, it's interesting, the Vanaras who assisted Lord Ramachandra in his battle with Ravana uh, were some pretty interesting creatures. They had ape-like bodies, but human-like intelligence. You know, they wore clothes, they, they had speech, they could communicate with Lord Ram and Lakshman, and they had um, a simple level of uh, culture, but they were still very intelligent. In other words, they were something like the modern concept of ape men. So it wasn't that European scientist of the 19th century like Darwin were the first to think of that there are some intermediate beings between you know, apes and monkeys and the human population. So So, but the, the question is, did these evolve one from the other or was, were they simply coexisting? And the evidence that we get from the Vedic literature is, you know, they were coexisting with each other. These apes and monkeys, human beings, the Vanaras, which are sort of like the modern, in some ways, the modern concept of ape men from a particular perspective. So, but 
in any case, you know, if we, I found that if we look in the current textbooks of archaeology and anthropology, we don't find any archaeological evidence that humans like ourselves were existing millions and millions of years ago. So, um, now there is a certain category of evidence that is still there today in India that is actually quite intriguing and interesting. But, uh, but here we're talking about, and I'm, I'll, I'll mention some of that a little bit later, but in terms of scientifically reported evidence, if you look in the current textbooks, you don't see any evidence that humans like us were existing millions of years ago. But what I decided to do when I took up my research on this topic was to look beyond the textbooks, look into what uh, we can call the primary scientific literature. Yeah, you know, we can divide the scientific literature into two parts, primary and secondary. And primary reports means, say in the case of archaeology, the reports, the original reports of archaeologists, geologists, other scientists who are digging into the earth, what they're finding. And it's published in their professional scientific journals, their peer-reviewed scientific journals. That's the primary literature. And the secondary literature is something like textbooks that are based on the primary literature. So what I decided to do was look at the primary scientific literature of the past 150 years and not just the English language, but German, French, Italian, so many languages. And what I found is that there, if you look at the primary scientific literature, there are many reports of archaeologists, geologists, other scientists finding human bones, human artifacts, and human footprints, showing that humans like us have existed on this planet for tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of, of years ago. So I had to ask myself, if this evidence is there in the original scientific reports, then why isn't it in today's textbooks? And I think that's because of a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. And this has been noticed by many historians of science, like Thomas Kuhn in his influential book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, put forward this idea that science operates according to you know, in, in a particular scientific discipline according to a paradigm. And by paradigm, he meant a certain set of fixed ideas about what the important questions are, how they should be investigated, what the conclusions are, and evidence that conforms to a paradigm will pass through this knowledge filter very easily. But if you have evidence that radically contradicts the dominant paradigm in a scientific discipline, uh, it won't pass through that filter. It'll be set aside, forgotten, dismissed on some flimsy grounds. So 
you don't hear very much about it. It, it won't be included in the, in, in the textbooks. So what I did in my book, Forbidden Archaeology, is take these reports from the primary scientific literature these reports of human bones, human artifacts, human footprints, millions of year, years old, put them together in a book so that people could have the full range of evidence that's related to this question of human antiquity. So, as I said, you know, according to Rupa Goswami, you know, the pastimes of Lord Ram took place in the Treta Yuga of the 28th Chatra Yuga of the current or seventh Vivasvata Manvatar period of the current day of Brahma. So, that's millions of years ago. Even if you want to say the pastimes of Lord Ram took place in the most recent Treta Yuga, that would still be about 1,800,000 years ago, which for many modern scientists is just completely impossible. They think humans like us first appeared less than 300,000 years ago. But I'll, I'll give some examples of the kind of scientific evidence that I'm talking about. In, in the 19th century, gold was discovered in California, and miners came to California to get the gold, and they were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains like Table Mountain in the Sierra Nevada mountains in central California near the town of Sonora. And deep inside these tunnels, the miners were finding human bones and human artifacts. For example, they were finding many stone mortars and pestles. And you know, I mean, these may seem primitive. It's not like you're finding a computer 50 million years old or something. It's, it's simple tools, but according to archaeologists, a, a mortar and pestle is the type of implement that could only be made by made and used by someone with human-like intelligence. They don't think any of the different species of ape men like the Neanderthals or the Homo habilis or Homo erectus could, could manufacture and use such things. They also found obsidian spear points. You know, they found human skeletal remains of the anatomically modern type. And these discoveries came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. And he personally visited the sites, inspected the artifacts, began to collect them. And you know, what makes these things so interesting to me is that the human bones and the human artifacts were found in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old. So for a, a modern archaeologist, that's just impossible. It's beyond imagination. But for what we might call a Vedic archaeologist, wouldn't be surprising at all. Uh, a Vedic archaeologist would expect to find evidence for a human presence going all the way back to the beginnings, the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. Because 
according to the Vedic literature, we aren't just uh, machines made of molecules that have somehow evolved on this planet in an accidental universe. According to the Vedic cosmology, the universe has a purpose. And the purpose is to allow conditioned souls to develop their consciousness and qualify themselves to go to the spiritual world where they can live in eternity, knowledge, and bliss as eternal associates of the Supreme Conscious Being, Krishna. And that is the whole purpose of having a universe and to develop our consciousness to be able to do that requires a human body. So according to the Vedic cosmology, the human body has always been available from the beginning of, of the universe. So, so it wouldn't be surprising to a Vedic archaeologist to find evidence for a human presence 50 million years ago or 18 million years ago or even further back in, in time. So, so these discoveries from the California gold mines, you know, the human bones and the human artifacts 50 million years old were initially reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was a Harvard-educated geologist who was the chief government geologist of California in the late 19th century. He reported these discoveries to the scientific world in a, a report that came out from Harvard University in the year 1880. But we don't hear about these things today very much because of the process of knowledge filtration. You know, there was another scientist, a contemporary of Dr. Whitney's, called, his name was uh, William Holmes. He was an anthropologist working for the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And he said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, he would not have come to those conclusions you know, that he published, uh, despite the imposing array of testimony and evidence with which he was confronted. And I'll translate that for you. It means if the evidence didn't fit the theory of evolution, it shouldn't have been published by Dr. Whitney. So, it, it, according to Holmes, it, it should just have been thrown away. And basically, that's what happened. However, some of the artifacts from the California gold mines are still in the collection of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California in Berkeley. And I got permission from the directors of the museum to study and photograph those artifacts for a talk I gave at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress And they are still there. They're not kept in the museum itself. They're not displayed. They're kept in a storage building a, a few miles from the museum. But, you know, they are there. And I also went into the Sierra Nevada mountains and relocated some of the gold mining tunnels, the 19th century gold mining tunnels, where these things were originally 
discovered. So things like this continue to be discovered, but you know, the, even the scientists who find them really don't understand what they really are. You know, for example, in 1979, uh, Mary Leakey, who was a, a prominent archaeologist, discovered footprints at a place called Leitoli in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. And these footprints were preserved in layers of volcanic ash, solidified volcanic ash that were about 3,700,000 years old. And in her original reports, Mary Leakey said, the footprints are identical to those made by modern humans. So, but she didn't accept that humans like ourselves made them. So she just proposed that three or four million years ago, there must have been some kind of ape man who had feet exactly like modern human feet. Now, that's an interesting idea, but there isn't any physical evidence to support it. You know, scientists have found skeletons of the ape men that existed at that time. They're called Australopithecus. And their foot structure is not like that of a modern human being. Their, uh, their foot was more like that of a chimpanzee with long toes, a, a first toe that could go out to the side like a human thumb. Actually, the only creature known to science today that has a foot exactly like that of a modern human being is human being like us. So I think Mary Leakey found evidence for humans like us existing millions of years ago. So if this kind of knowledge filtration took place once or twice, then you could say, well, all right, so there's a few mysterious cases, but you know, the vast majority of the evidence supports the view that humans like us appeared only two or three hundred thousand years ago, which means that these stories that we find in the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and the Bhagavad Purana, that is not to be taken literally. It, some mythology, that's all there is to it. So I don't think that that's really the case. But um, as a devotee, however, I don't require archaeological evidence because evidence based on protection anumana is ultimately imperfect. Sense evidence, logical inferences are ultimately not the best kind of evidence. Statement from Guru, Shastra, and Sadhu is the best kind of evidence and that's the kind of evidence that I really rely upon. But for those who at the present moment don't accept the Shabda Pramana Shastra as evidence, then there are some things from the world of Pratyakshan Anumana that are consistent with the evidence that comes from the Shabda Pramana. And if by giving such people a little bit of this evidence that it, it attracts them 
to the real sources of knowledge, the Vedic literature, the Shastras, the Shabda Pramana, then maybe that's a good thing for them. But just in terms of things that are currently there in India, it's kind of interesting at Udupi, and uh, I think it's the Karnataka state, Udupi, there are deities of Sita and Ram that Srila Prabhupada speaks about in his purports to the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the part where Lord Chaitanya is visiting with the uh, followers of Madhvacharya. And during the time of Lord Ram, in the city of Ayodhya, there was a Brahman who would fast every time Lord Ramachandra left Ayodhya. And once Ramachandra left for over a week and this Brahmin had fasted during his entire absence. And Ramachandra was so impressed with this Brahmin that he told Lakshman to give him, give this Brahmana a set of Sita Ram deities that had been worshipped by the kings in Ayodhya since the time of Ikshvaku. So Ram appeared in what's called the Surya Vamsa, the line of kings that ultimately come from Vivasvan, you know, the sun god. Just like uh, uh, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, Imam Vivasvate Yogam Proktavanaham Aliyam. I originally spoke this knowledge to the sun god Vivasvan, who spoke it to Manu, uh, Swayambhuva Manu, who then spoke it to his, to King Ikshvaku. So this King Ikshvaku the founder of the Surya Vamsa in Ayodhya, he, he existed at the beginning of the current Manvantar, the Vaivasvata Manvantar, about 120 million years ago. So that deity of Sita and Ram had been worshipped in Ayodhya from the time of King Ikshvaku for millions of years down to the time of Lord Ram in the Treta Yuga of the uh, 24th Chatur Yuga of our current Manvantar. So then that uh, Brahman worshipped the deity until the end of his life and then it kind of passed into the hands of uh, uh, Hanuman and then to different lines of kings until it, until the time of Madhvacharya when the same deities were installed in Udupi, where they can be seen today. So, you know, sometimes people wonder: Is there, you know, evidence, you know, from the? So there, there is evidence. You know, the statements of Shastra, the existence of these deities, or another case of an object that still can be seen today from the time of Lord Ram is the 
Ranganath deity. It's a reclining form of Vishnu uh, that's at the Sri Rangam temple in Tamil Nadu in South India. It's a fantastic temple, wonderful deity. But according to the temple histories, that deity was uh, originally worshipped by Lord Brahma on Brahma Loka, and then it was transferred to uh, the sun planet where it was worshipped by Vivasan. And then it came like the deities of Sita Ram into the hands of Ikshvaku and was uh, worshipped and <clears throat> until the time of Lord Ram when it was at, after the battle of Lanka Vibhishana who was the brother of Ravana but he had helped Lord Ram he accompanied Ram back to from South India from Lanka they took the Vimana or the the airplane of Ravana and took it back to Ayodhya and there Ram gave him this deity of Ranganath and he was going to take it back to Lanka Vibhishana was going to take it back to Lanka, but he stopped in Tamil Nadu on the banks of this river Kaveri. And the condition was that if he stopped anywhere, the deity would remain at that spot. So he had to stop. If the deity remained at that spot, local king built a temple for the deity, but then over the course of many yugas, it, the temple was lost, buried, covered by jungle. And then about 10,000 years ago or so, a, a king of the Chola dynasty in South India uh, went to, he was in that forest, he fell asleep, and in a dream, the location of the deity was revealed to him. So he excavated the deity of Ranganath and then built you know, the uh, beginnings of the temple that is now there at Sri Rangam in South India. And you know, the deity can still be seen there today. So it also has a very ancient history. So there are so there are some uh, things from the time of Lord Ram that are still visible today in 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 India. And of course, this, I was asked to speak about the antiquity of the human species in connection with the appearance of Lord Ramachandra. So I've tried in, in this talk to lay out some of those historical aspects to this. But in the history of the world, there are many events that take place. You could just imagine that, I mean, just even in terms of recent history, you know, there's so many newspapers, so many books published. Uh, there are so many things that happen. But, you know, according to the Vedic literature, there's an even longer history 
that goes back to the very beginnings of the universe. And what are the most important events in that long history? Uh, the most important events are the appearances of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in this world. And why is that? It's because the universe has a purpose. It's a consciousness-based universe, not just some accident, you know, some quantum mechanical fluctuation. The universe has a purpose. And the, the purpose, the purpose is that there are some conscious selves, some atmas, some conscious selves who at the present moment aren't fit to exist in the spiritual world. And this universe is an opportunity for them to do two things. We can either follow the path of Ravana, try to become more and more deeply entangled in trying to enjoy separately from Krishna by exploiting his energies his material energies. You know, in other words, we're trying to exploit, dominate, and control the material energy in competing groups. So we can either go further and further down that path, or we can take the path of trying to understand I'm an eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, and Somehow or other, I've fallen into this material world. Let me take advantage of this opportunity to uh, restore my real nature as eternal servant. Bhamaivamso jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. I'm an eternal fragmental part of Krishna. And to help us do that, Krishna comes in his various incarnations to do that. Parichranaya sadhunam vinashya jadushkrita dharma samstapanartaya sambhavami yuge yuge. I come to help those who want to become my devotees and to uh, put down those who are on the other path and to give people the proper religious principles by which they can satisfy their material needs in this world in the most simple, natural, efficient, and fair way possible while putting most of their human energy into developing their consciousness to the level of Krishna consciousness. And Krishna himself comes to help us do that. And today we are celebrating the one of those appearances, it's the appearance of Lord Ram, who really we can see acted in that way where he's protecting his devotees, opposing those who are causing disturbance in the world and misleading people, taking them in the wrong direction, and giving real religious principles, not you know, the various kinds of cheating religion, Sarva Dharma and Pritya Mame Kam Sharanam Raja, Krishna explained in the Bhagavad Gita, give up all varieties of false religion. Simply surrender unto me. So Lord Ramachandra in his way 
was doing that. All glories to Lord Ramachandra. All glories to his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and all of his sincere followers and the International Society for Krishna Consciousness that he created. Sita Ram Kijai, thank you very much.